Thank you for the opportunity also uh, that EIMF is uh, providing for me to, uh, to conduct this webinar today. So hello, hi everybody. My name is uh, Geert Vermeulen or Gert Vermeulen is also fine with me. And today we're going to talk about the EU whistleblower directive, what to expect. So um, uh, a quick introduction. Uh, so this is what we're going to be discussing today. So an introduction, why the new EU directive for short history uh, the benefits of a solid whistleblowing system, what is new, what does it mean for you, and some uh, good practices, how to deal with this new directive. Okay, so um, quick introduction. So uh, indeed, thanks Mario. So my, my mission uh, is uh, to help organizations act in an ethical and compliant way. I've previously been an uh, in-house chief compliance officer. Uh, but some five, six years ago, I established the ECMC. I'm a, a teacher, trainer, speaker, consultant, and interim ethics and compliance officer. And um, uh, perhaps good to know is that later this year, I'm going to provide training again, uh, uh, training at the EIMF. So uh, I'm going to provide training on uh, how to set up uh, a compliance program, how to set up, uh, uh, how to do uh, a compliance risk assessment but also how to set up an anti-corruption program and how to conduct third party due diligence. So uh, if you are interested in those kind of topics, uh, uh, please keep watching the EIMF. Uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna be teaching on those topics uh, later this year. Okay, so uh, a year ago, I founded a new company called the Integrity Coordinator, and this has everything to do with the new EU whistleblowing directive. I'm also quite active in the profession. So I'm the former president of the Dutch Compliance Officer Association, um, the, the chair of the expert group on financial economic crime. Um, I'm in the advisory committee of the Hague University where I advise the university on the content of the course. And uh, I'm also re really proud to uh, have been awarded uh, the National Compliance Award of the Netherlands in uh, 2020. So. Okay, so um, um, and now we're going to do um, a, a quick poll uh, because I'm uh, very curious to see what is what are your roles. So I think uh, Adonis is going to launch the poll. So what is your role? Are you a compliance officer, a compliance services provider? Are you part of the company management or other? <laughs> yes, and I notice that it's, uh, quite a few people are also already filling in the second question. Um, so um, the, the second question is, uh, where are you based? So are you based in Cyprus, the Netherlands, other EU countries or non-EU countries? Okay. Just a couple of more seconds before we end the poll. Um, okay. Just to share the results. Can you see the results here? Yes, I can see the results. So, um, um, uh, so what I see is that uh, most of the people um, attending the uh, the webinar are actually compliance officers. So uh, I would say I'm in good company. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so um, um, that's uh, well, people similar to me. Um, also, quite a few people working in compliance services. Eighteen so percent. And, uh, uh, but there's also quite a few people who work in other industries. So, uh, uh, well, I would be really interested to, to know where, but um, uh, perhaps we will find out later. So then also uh, the question, where are you based? So I understand that um, almost half of the people are situated in the Netherlands, uh, sorry, in Cyprus, in Cyprus, two people from the Netherlands. So uh, I, I will not discuss the uh, situation in the Netherlands uh, at length. Uh, also quite a few people in other EU countries uh, and four people uh, outside of the EU. Okay, okay, well, good to know who you are. So um, uh, let's continue. Uh, should I uh, delete the poll? I think it's okay, it's not showing now on the screen. So, okay. So, um, okay, so that was already part number one, the introduction, part number two, why the new EU directive? So a, a short history. Well, uh, if I look at myself, so um, uh, let's say in the time period of 2006, 2009, I was working for a US-based company. 
Um, and I was working on compliance with Sarbanes Oxley legislation, which meant that we had to roll out whistleblowing procedures um, in all the countries with, where we were present. So I was uh, rolling out whistleblowing procedures in the 60 countries in Europe, Middle East and Africa that I was coordinating. Um, and that was quite a, a, a challenge, especially in the EU countries, because I learned that uh, the local legislation in each EU country was different. Uh, so uh, the data privacy legislation in each country was a little bit different. Uh, and as a result, like for example, so for this US-based company, I had to coordinate uh, the whistleblowing procedure uh, because I usually I could not share uh, any personal data with my US colleagues or the colleagues of the other regions. So I was coordinating uh, what we call the data privacy tier. Also in uh, a number of countries, like for example, France, the, uh, the uh, reports were limited to certain categories uh, like uh, fraud and corruption uh, and, and other uh, reports could not be made. There were countries where you could only make reports about the management um, or not about the management. <laughs> so in, in some countries, uh, anonymous uh, reporting was allowed and in other countries, it was not like for example in uh, Spain or in Germany. And in uh, also a number of countries we needed to have the approval of the Works Council uh, to, uh, to implement uh, a reporting procedure. So that um, uh, was also challenging in some of the European countries. So the general impression that I got, so let's say from 2005 to 2010, 2015, is that the, um, the, the general atmosphere in the European Union was not really welcoming. So if you were approaching the authorities, like for example, if you had to ask for approval with the CNIL, the French Data Privacy Authority, um, uh, for putting in place a whistleblowing procedure, um, it was not exactly that they were uh, inviting you with open arms. Yeah? So they were more like a bit like uh, holding back. Now in 2015, to 2020, things started changing. So we noticed that public opinion started changing in many of the EU countries and national legislation as well. In the Netherlands, for example, there was some whistleblowing legislation uh, introduced in 2016. And in Lithuania in 2017, or, uh, there was a law on the protection of whistleblowers, including uh, rewards for the whistleblowers. In France uh, in 2018, uh, as a result of the Loi Sapin 2, uh, um, there was uh, uh, all the companies with more than 50 employees also had to put in place whistleblowing procedures. And um, Ireland introduced a hotline and Italy also implemented laws to protect whistleblowers. Uh, a year later in 2019, we saw that the Slovak Republic uh, took another step ahead and uh, implemented the act on the protection of whistleblowers, also including rewards for whistleblowers. So at this moment, I would say the Slovak Republic and Lithuania are, as far as I know, the only two countries in the EU uh, that offer whistleblowing rewards. And we also saw the, the atmosphere in Germany and Spain changing. So um, uh, where previously anonymous reporting was prohibited, uh, they uh, all of a sudden they allowed anonymous reporting. And this has something to do with all of this. So um, uh, let's say in the in roughly the same time period, we saw a, a whole lot of uh, leaks, let's say, or X papers, how that I sometimes call them. So I think in 2016, we saw the Panama papers. And a little bit later, we had the Paradise papers and the Swiss leaks and the Luxembourg leaks and the Bahama leaks and, and what have you. So um, I also clearly remember the football leaks. Um, and I think um, from, um, for this webinar, especially relevant have been the Luxembourg leaks. So what we saw there is that there were two people, namely Antoine Daltour and Raphael Hallet, uh, who used to be working for PricewaterhouseCoopers. Uh, what they were doing is that they were leaking confidential information about tax deals of large corporations in Luxembourg. And they were leaking that information to journalists in 2014. And there was a lot of commotion in the press. So a lot of people said, okay, so this is not fair that these large corporations that they have these, uh, these, these beneficial tax deals in Luxembourg. Um, so so it, things shouldn't work like that. So there was a lot of commo commotion in the press and with the general public. 
uh, and Del Tour and Hallet got prosecuted because they had disclosed confidential information. And at first instance, uh, they were both uh, sentenced to jail. Uh, so um, uh, Del Tour for 12 months in jail and Hallet nine months in jail, and they got a, a well, a, a fine, a monetary fine. Uh, but the commotion didn't stop. So uh, the, the public commotion kept on going. And what we also saw is that the uh, Del Tour and Halle, they went to, to appeal against the decision. And the, 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 uh, the higher court judge, they uh, uh, sentenced them again, but now to a suspended jail sentence. So they didn't have to go to jail. And again, Del Tour and Halle were not happy with that. So they said, okay, so we acted uh, in the interest of the general public. And that is why we disclosed that um, information. And in the end, so they went uh, into appeal again. So for, for the second time, and in the end, they were actually, they were acquitted. So what we have seen here in the, in the course of a couple of years is that we have seen public opinion shifting. And it looks like uh, the judges uh, also took that into account uh, when they were ruling on those cases. So in the end, Del Tour and Hallet were uh, uh, acquitted. Another effect that we see on this case is that we, uh, we saw a lot of co uh, commotion around uh, taxing multinationals. Uh, the European Commission started looking into that, also the OECD. And um, uh, one of the results of all this commotion has been that we now have the BEPS. So it's uh, the, the base erosion and profit shifting. And, and only recently, I think something like last week, 130 countries agreed on a minimum tax percentage for, uh, for, for, for multinationals. So, um, uh, so what we see here is um, um, documents were leaked, there were whistleblowers. Uh, initially, the whistleblowers were prosecuted. Uh, but what we see is that there's going to be a, a big change in law, uh, which is going to have quite an effect, I, I gather. Um, so, so we see that the whistleblowers, they, uh, they, they raise something towards the general public. And as a result, uh, we, we're going to have um, a lot of commotion and a big change in law. Uh, and what we then often see is that the, the only people who suffer are actually the whistleblowers themselves. Uh, so um, even though they have been acquitted in the end, uh, they have um, suffered uh, quite a, a miserable time. It's a bit similar to what happened in the United States with Bradley Birkenfeld. So um, Bradley Birkenfeld was a, a banker who used to work for UBS. And uh, when he was still working as a banker, private banker in, in the United States, he was helping uh, rich American clients uh, to hide their money in Swiss bank accounts. Um, at a given moment, he thought, okay, so this is not right. Yeah, so he, uh, he went to the authorities to the IRS, the tax authorities, and he, um, he, he disclosed all the information that he had. Uh, and in the end, we saw, uh, um, again, a, a big change in the legislation. So now we have FATCA. Uh, and I think I would also even say the end of the Swiss bank secrecy laws um, um, has a so huge effect uh, as a result of this whistleblower. Um, Bradley Birkenfeld himself, by the way, uh, I understand, um, um, uh, on the one hand, um, he got a, um, so there is a, I think the US tax authorities, they earned a, over a billion, um, over a billion US dollars with this uh, in, in tax. Uh, and there is, in the US, there is a, a law that uh, whistleblowers can get 10 to 30% uh, of, uh, of, of the fine. So in this case, uh, Mr. Birkenfeld got just over 100 million US dollars. So uh, that's uh, always nice to have. On the other hand, he was also complicit in the illegal act. So he, he, he was also sent to jail for, I think, something like five years. Uh, but I know he is free now, and I think he's living in Malta at the moment. So um, enjoying his uh, 100 million, I guess. Yeah. So in, in 2018, the European Commission also started looking into this case, and uh, they come up came up with the first proposal for uh, protecting whistleblowers. So in 2018, uh, we had the proposal from the commission. And when they were re uh, launching this proposal, uh, Mr. Frans Timmermans, my fellow countryman, said, uh, while referring to LuxLeaks especially, but also to the Panama Papers and the Cambridge Analytical uh, Analytica scandal, 
He said, many recent scandals may never have come to light if insiders haven't had the courage to speak out. And, and we have to better protect whistleblowers so we can better detect and prevent harm to the public interest. And there should be no punishment for doing the right thing. So that is why they came up with this new whistleblower protection law. The directive, I should say. So here you see again, uh, Mr. Mr. Timmermans on the, on the left, together with his colleague Vera Jourova, the Commissioner for Justice, uh, Consumer Rights and Gender Equality. Uh, and Vera Jourova added to that, we need to support people who are ready to take the risk to uncover serious violations of EU law. And we owe it to the honest people of Europe. Of course, uh, if you know my mission, you, you will understand that I buy into that. So, but uh, what do you think? Uh, what do you think? So this is uh, uh, the next poll question. So what do you think? Do you think that whistleblowers are heroes? Whistleblowers are traitors? Or you just don't know? So please take the poll. You see the first couple of answers coming in. You know, I've um, handled quite a few whistleblowing cases over the last couple of years. So um, I've been working in this field since 2007, 2000, yeah, so 2007, roundabout. Um, and I've handled uh, a couple hundred cases. So, um, okay, so I see that the large majority of the people voting, they vote that whistleblowers are heroes. Okay, so that's- Let me share the, uh, let me share the results. Yes, please. Here. Okay. Okay, so I think this is quite remarkable. So nobody thinks whistleblowers are traitors. I think uh, if you know some of the, the famous whistleblowers, maybe it's because of the examples that I picked, huh? but uh, uh, let's say one of the other famous whistleblowers is somebody like uh, Edward Snowden. Um, um, has, so um, uh, I think uh, sometimes these cases are not that clear cut. Uh, you know, uh, people, some people will say, okay, so we are happy with the, uh, uh, the facts and circumstances that uh, Mr. Snowden has uh, disclosed, uh, but other people would say, okay, so but he damaged the vital uh, safety and security uh, uh, of the United States and, and some uh, individuals as well. So that, um, I, I would even say, so I'm also inclined to say that they are heroes. Um, but uh, sometimes the picture is a bit more mixed. But uh, in general, I would also choose, in, uh, uh, yes, I think they are heroes. Uh, but uh, uh, I would say not all of them. <laughs> okay, so I'm uh, gonna close the poll. Okay, so um, uh, I, was, I think that was it for part number, yep, for part number two. So let's move to part number three. Um, uh, okay, so uh, what are the benefits of a solid whistleblowing system? So let me quickly go into that. So when they, the European Commission was launching this initiative, they also ordered a study um, uh, looking at, okay, so what does it mean? Huh? So what does it mean if we solely focus on public procurement? What would be the economic benefits? And I'm an uh, economist by background, uh, so uh, I buy into this stuff. So what are the economic benefits? of whistleblowing protection in the EU. So they ordered a study and the study came up with a, with a, a, money, a money amount and they said, okay, so we estimate, estimate that um, um, protecting whistleblowers uh, might save us some 5.6 to 9.6 billion euros annually in the EU. So only focusing on public procurement. So, so there are some clear, let's say macroeconomic benefits to protecting whistleblowers. But let me also take it, um, uh, let's say one level down on the micro level. Uh, so, um, you know, as I said, so I investigated quite a few uh, cases, uh, uh, quite a few whistleblowing cases. And what I discovered um, when I was um, uh, investigating those cases uh, is that um, uh, there's something called the, the fraud triangle. And uh, I often came across um, uh, two or let's say most of the time, even all three of the, uh, the, the items, all three of the, um, uh, the, um, um, the items of the fraud triangle. 
So usually when something goes wrong, um, what you see often is that there is pressure. So there is pressure from the management uh, uh, to get certain results, uh, to have a certain amount of um, uh, revenue pressure because you want to meet your bonus target. But pressure can also come from your personal life. Let's say maybe somebody has a, a lot of debts and they need to repay their debts. And, and that can also give uh, a lot of pressure. Or maybe somebody has, a, has a, a relative who is sick and that can also generate pressure. So usually when things go wrong, there is an element of pressure and there is an, an, an opportunity. So there is an, an opportunity, like for example, to commit a fraud um, uh, and then what you also see very often is that people rationalize it. So like, okay, so yeah, you know, really I had to do that uh, because otherwise um, uh, I, I would not have any money or uh, I had to do that uh, because otherwise the company wouldn't survive. Um, and this is something that you might actually see at this moment in the last couple of years, in the last one and a half year in the Corona situation where people sometimes start doing strange things uh, just to make sure um, that they or the company that they survive. But rationalization can also be, well, I, I, I have seen my boss doing that as well. So uh, if my boss can do that, why can't I do that? So, uh, uh, so nobody wants to be seen as a bad person. So people rationalize things. Now, when I'm setting up an ethics and compliance program um, against the, uh, the fraud triangle, I use the ethics and compliance triangle. So um, uh, the ethics and compliance triangle consists of governance, controls, and culture and behavior. So with governance, I usually, I focus on the governance of the compliance function, but you can also look at the governance of the, of the overall company. Like, okay, so what are the checks and balances in the company? Um, I also focus on the controls. So what are the controls? What, what are controls do we have in place to combat fraud, for example, or bribery or corruption? Uh, but I also look at culture and behavior. So what is the culture of the company? Um, and, and, and what is the, in general, the, the, uh, what does it mean for the individual behavior? Yeah. So um, uh, this is the model that I usually use when I set up an ethics and compliance program. And I wanna, when I'm gonna be teaching later this year for EIMF, uh, I'm gonna be looking into this model uh, much more in depth but today we're gonna to focus on only one item, namely on uh, responding to concerns, speak up procedures. If you ask me, uh, I consider it to be a, a really essential part of my compliance program. As I said, I have um, uh, handled a, a couple hundred cases and sometimes I discovered things through whistleblowers that I would never have discovered in any other way. Uh, so, so sometimes despite of all the controls that I had put in place, um, sometimes um, uh, some person would report something to me through the whistleblowing channel uh, and come up with, with some unethical pra practices that I would never have discovered in any other way. So let's say in general, I'm, I'm pretty, I've been pretty happy with my whistleblowers. That is usually when a, a report comes in, I think, uh oh, extra work. So uh, <laughs> I'm not always looking for more work, um, but on balance, I would say um, um, when I have done that, completed the investigation, um, uh, I, I would normally, I would say, okay, so I'm, I'm usually I'm quite happy that there was somebody who had the courage to, uh, to report something. Yeah. Also, there is a, uh, this, this, let's say, uh, especially in the Netherlands where I come from, this connotation like, okay, so um, it is dangerous to blow the whistle. Huh? So, um, uh, but you know, in, in all of those couple of hundred cases, the, 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 the couple hundred whistle, uh, whistle, whistleblowers that I have uh, been in touch with, as far as I know, up until now, and I, have, I should knock wood, <laughs> um, maybe I'm also a little bit lucky, uh, but, but up until now, you, you will not have seen them in the press. Uh, maybe with one exception, um, uh, but um, um, with most of the people ended up reasonably well. Uh, so um, it all, so it all depends on, on how well you handle those cases. And I, um, I think um, one or two years ago, I was at a compliance conference and I was um, also a compliance officer from a multinational company. And he said, well, I handle 300 cases a year. 
300 investigations. So probably he had he, he even had more reports and he had 300 investigations every year. And, and I didn't know any of his whistleblower, any of his whistleblowers. So, so, you know, he was doing something right. And um, yeah, so there's also this uh, report from the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. So if you are um, a fraud examiner, you will be uh, familiar with this report. The association uh, publishes uh, a biannual report. So um, uh, every other year and, and the results, the, uh, the, the figures are usually more or less the same. So uh, what we see, what they discovered is that they, uh, they say, okay, so the average loss due to fraud is around 5% of the revenue of a company. And more than 50% of all the frauds are discovered through reporters. And then if they look at the identity of the reporters, they find out that let's say some 50%, so, so um, half of the reporters are actually your own employees. Uh, so you discover your the fraud that occur in your company. Most of the frauds you discover through your own employees who, uh, who ring the bell, who blow the whistle. Uh, the, uh, the second um, category here is 22% uh, of the frauds are discovered through clients. 15% um, are anonymous, so we don't know who they are. Huh? They can be employees as well, or also clients. And 11% of the reports are through uh, suppliers. So I would say you do the math. Huh? So, so how much does it cost to have a good uh, whistleblowing procedure? And, and how much is 5% of the revenue of your company. So, um, um, you know, um, if, if you put a, a really good whistleblowing procedure and investigation protocol in place, uh, I'm, I'm sure in the end that, that will save you some money. Moreover, there has been some, uh, some research from, um, I'm just gonna put on the light a little bit, uh, because um, outside it's uh, really raining heavily now. Uh, but um, uh, there's also this report from um, uh, the George Washington University, Mr. Kyle Welsh. Um, so he discovered that companies with more whistleblowing reports actually have better financial results. So that is a bit contraintuitive. Huh? So you would expect if you have more whistleblowers, uh, there must be something wrong. So if you have more whistleblowing reports, something must be going wrong um, and you would expect to see a loss, but it's actually, it's the other way around. Uh, so if you have more whistleblowing reports, what we see is that uh, when you have more internal reports, you have fewer whistleblower reports from outside. Um, organizations have fewer litigation costs, fewer lawsuits and, and a higher return on assets. So, uh, and, and so how does that work? Well, it has to do a little bit with, uh, you know, creating the right ethical culture in a company. Uh, so because ethical companies perform better financially in the long term. And uh, I, I put here a picture of this uh, report from the Boston Consulting Group uh, that provides some empirical evidence for these statements. So how does that work? Well, I think if you have a good speak up system, you will be able to identify and address problems early on. So be, before they grow out to become a really big problem. Uh, so if you are on top of the problems, the potential problems at the start, you can identify and address them early. So then you will also have fewer investigation costs and also fewer litigation costs. Eh? So if you don't have to go to court, if you are not prosecuted by the authorities, that will save you a lot of costs. Uh, and you will also save money in fines. Moreover, you will have fewer management time spent on problems. Eh? So the management, they can spend uh, their management time not on problems, but on uh, making business. Uh, so who doesn't want that? You will have a better reputation. You will be better able to attract good employees. Um, um, clients will appreciate they, they want to buy from companies with a good reputation. And all of this will increase the trust. Eh? So you, the organizational justice will increase the trust. And that again will stimulate the sharing of knowledge and ideas. Eh? So if everybody has keeps their own creative ideas for themselves, um, uh, okay, that's, um, um, you will see that if you start sharing those ideas with other people, uh, you will accomplish more. 
So you will have a more, a better, more creative work environment. And I think that is how it works. So um, now back to the EU whistleblower protection directive. So what is new in this new directive? Huh? So what does it mean for you? So in this new directive, um, uh, which was approved, so it was proposed in 2018, it was adopted by European par Parliament and European Council on uh, October 23rd, 2019, and uh, so, some one and a half year ago, and it prohibits the retaliation against whistleblowers. Uh, so the, the, uh, the directive protects whistleblowers, as you would expect. So then who are whistleblowers? Well, whistleblowers are people, individuals who report wrongdoing encountered in a work-related context. And they are protected against uh, a, a number of things. So, so um, um, uh, including dismissal, uh, suspension, demotion, poor evaluation, uh, and so on. Moreover, I think uh, very important for the, com the countries that already have whistleblown um, legislation in place, there is a reversal of the burden of proof. Uh, so, you know, if there is, if you, if there is a, a somebody who uh, who blows the whistle, who makes a report, and uh, this person will be demoted or doesn't get a bonus or gets a, a bad uh, evaluation, the person might argue, well, now I'm, I'm getting demoted or uh, I'm getting a, a bad appraisal because I blew the whistle, uh, because I've, I submitted a report. And then it's up to the company, up to the organization, to evidence that that is not the case. Uh, so that the bad performance review is not the result of the whistleblowing report. So I, I take it that that might actually be become quite challenging in the future. It also, the, the directive also says that each country has to set up a, a national whistleblowing authority, an, an independent authority, and, and also provide advice and psychological support. So it doesn't say anything about monetary support, but it says uh, advice and psychological support. Because, uh, you know, blowing the whistle can be quite tough from a, a, a psychological point of view. The directive also says that um, they encourage that people first report internally. Now, there are some national legislations that say that you have to report in, uh, internally first. That is no longer the case. So there is no obligation to first report um, internally, but it is encouraged, but not obliged. So, you know, if I'm a compliance officer, I would encourage everybody to please report internally and not go straight to the authorities uh, because that is also possible. Also, another obligation is that organizations have to set up a confidential and secured whistleblowing procedure. Um, and that can be in writing, orally or both. And there is a, a little bit of addendum to that. So if somebody is gonna report uh, orally, uh, like for example, through a telephone line, or in person, they can request an in-person meeting um, um, with, let's say, the coordinator, because that's the uh, the next topic. Uh, organizations have to uh, nominate, have to appoint an impartial and competent coordinator. Uh, so um, uh, that is to say, so in the new Dutch legislation, it says independent, but the EU legislation says impartial. So somebody who is impartial and competent. So who knows how to handle those cases. It also says that small organizations can share resources. So, so that's, uh, I would say, the upside. Now, you are not going to get a fine if you don't have a reporting procedure. But uh, there is also this, this requirement that if somebody makes uh, a report, you have to confirm the report within seven days after making the report and provide substantial feedback to the supporter about what you did with the report within three months. Now, if you don't do that, or if the reporter has reason to believe that nothing will happen with their report, or if there is no reporting procedure at all, um, the whistleblower doesn't have to go, have to uh, report internally first, and they can go straight to the authorities or even to the media. 
And the uh, tricky thing here is that um, if you have a confidentiality clause in the contract with your employees, that no longer applies. And so you cannot keep um, employees to any confidentiality or secrecy clauses. So if you do not take their whistleblowing report seriously, or if you don't have a whistleblowing procedure at all, uh, the whistleblowers can take their case straight to the authorities or to the, to the press, uh, and um, uh, you cannot prosecute them for breaching confidentiality rules. So I gather that's going to be, that, that, that's going to have quite a few consequences. Oh, okay. So of course, the, this is an EU uh, regulation. Uh, this is an EU directive. It's not a regulation. So if you look at a regulation, a regulation applies directly in each of the EU member states, like for example, the GDPR. Uh, so it's the same all over the EU, though in practice you will see, still see some small differences between the member states. Uh, but it, it, it basically it should be the same. Um, but this is a directive. So a directive sets the minimum requirements and then it asks countries to, uh, to implement uh, the legislation into the national law. So all of the member states, they have to implement this directive in the national law. Uh, similar like, for example, um, uh, the anti-money laundering directives. Huh? So what you also see here in practice is like, for example, um, um, in practice, there will be um, notable differences between the EU member states. So they will all have, the, let's say the basic level, uh, but uh, above the basic level, uh, countries can do um, other things. Um, and so they can put legislation on top of that uh, as they like. So that means the member states have to implement the legislation. Uh, and if we look at the situation a couple months ago, so in April, you will see that six of the 27 member states have not started yet. So, and one of them is Cyprus. <laughs> so um, as far as I know, um, uh, there is no um, um, legislation no um, at this moment um, uh, implementing the EU whistleblowing directive yet in Cyprus. So it looks like Cyprus is going to be late. Um, uh, and there are a couple more countries like uh, Austria, Hungary, Italy, Luxembourg, Malta. So my source is an EU whistleblowing meter. If you Google that, you can um, uh, monitor the progress uh, in your country. There is a, a, a public consultation in a number of countries and there are also a, a couple of countries where already a, a draft law has been proposed before parliament. Like for example, I think in Germany, but also in the Netherlands, a, a draft law has been proposed to parliament. But so far, no country adopted a final version of the law yet. Um, and of course, due to Brexit, I'm excluding the UK here. So the scope of the EU directive is about violations of EU law. Uh, so that is the, the minimum standard. So there are also a number of countries that go over and above that. So they say, okay, so we put in place a broader scope like Estonia, Latvia, the Czech Republic, Denmark, Sweden, Germany. They um, are looking at implementing legislation with a broader scope than just violations of EU law. In the Netherlands, we have seen a minimum implementation, uh, but it is on top of the already existing legislation regarding wrongdoing whereby the public interest is at stake. So if you look at the timeline, uh, time is getting short. Uh, so uh, as we see here, uh, the directive says that the directive has to be implemented into national law per December 17, 2021. But by that same date, it already applies to local communities with more than 10,000 people. It also will also immediately apply to all public and private organizations with more than 250 employees. Um, and um, yeah, there's something tricky in there uh, that not everybody knows or may be aware of, but it also applies to all organizations in financial services, regardless of their size. Uh, so if you, have, uh, if you are an insurance broker, or a, a, a managing general agent, or just a small company working in financial services, uh, this new EU directive will apply to you by the end of this year. And even though you may only have five employees, you have to appoint uh, uh, an independent coordinator, uh, which is, I think, uh, 
quite bothersome. Uh, it, it also applies to all organizations subject to anti-money laundering terrorist financing law, regardless of the size. Yeah? So if you are into, um, so it also applies to casinos, uh, notaries, law firms, accountancy firms, um, uh, and so on. So if anti-money laundering legislation applies to you, uh, this, uh, regardless of your size, uh, you have to put in place a whistleblowing procedure. Now, um, so organizations with between uh, who are not working in financial services and not subject to anti-money laundering legislation uh, with between 50 employees and 250 employees they get a, a, another two years to get ready for this uh, legislation uh, so um, uh, in 2023 end of 2000, 20, 2023 all organizations with more than 50 employees have to comply with this so what to do, I would say, uh, you know, if you are a compliance officer working in your company, just be ready on December 17 this year. And, and think about, okay, so um, it is possible that you have to change. If you don't have one yet, you, you may have to change or you have to put in place or, uh, a whistleblowing procedure. And maybe that whistleblowing procedure has to be approved by a works council or, or a union. Uh, so um, um, it, it, I think it would be a good to start working on this now. Then also, who can file a report? Eh? So it's, it says about whistleblowing in a work-related context. So, and that relates to employees, interns, contractors, trainees, volunteers, uh, but also non-executive directors, uh, but also shareholders, suppliers, people working for suppliers, people working for vendors, they are all um, um, allowed to uh, file a whistleblowing report and, um, uh, and they will be protected. Also people who assist the reporter, or uh, uh, the family, the immediate family of the reporters, they will also be uh, protected. So, so I would say what to do? Well, I would say open it up to anyone on your external website. Uh, I, I consider that to be a best practice anyway. Uh, an anonymity, so um, the EU directive says nothing about uh, anonymous reports. This is left to the national governments. So uh, anonymous reports, it's definitely not prohibited, uh, but it does not require you to, um, uh, to create this possibility. However, my advice would be to enable anonymous reports. Uh, I think this is a best practice anyway. So what is new? There is a, a broad definition of people who are protected. There is this reversal of the burden of proof uh, there has to be a, a reference to a national independent authority. So that will be a different authority in each of the member states. Uh, and so organizations have to put in place a reporting procedure and you have these timelines, confirmation within seven days and feedback within uh, three months. And otherwise the um, confidentiality clause will become invalid. And you have to appoint a competent impartial coordinator, which makes me wonder, okay, so, so do you have such a person is the coordinator really independent and if you are a compliance officer like for example do you have a compliance charter that guarantees your independence so that brings me to uh, the next poll so adonis maybe you can launch the next poll do you have an impartial or independent coordinator at this moment so we see the results coming in so yeah, quite a few people are voting. Great. Yeah. So um, we will uh, keep it open for another, let's say, 10 seconds or so. So uh, people, please feel free to vote. Do you have an impartial coordinator? OK, so I propose that we close the poll now and share the results. Yeah, so um, uh, let's say, okay, so hmm, that surprises me a little bit. So the majority of the attendees says that they do not have an impartial coordinator at the moment. Yeah, okay. Though also, you know, 42%, it's not bad. Quite a few people do have an impartial coordinator. Okay, good. So um, um, uh, let's have another look at that. Uh, so um, with the integrity coordinator, what do we do? So my new company, we provide easy to use whistleblowing um, procedure and an investigation procedure. And we provide that service 
to be an independent coordinator. Huh? So we can communicate confidentially with the reporter. So if a, re a report comes in, uh, we will receive the report, send back uh, the confirmation, discuss, discuss the issue with the management and coordinate the investigation if needed. Uh, in the Netherlands, we can also make uh, the mandatory annual report, what comes out of the procedure. So, um, uh, yeah, so we have uh, more than 14 years of experience rolling out coordinating whistleblowing procedures for both uh, multinationals and small organizations. Um, I'm also a member of a network of independent investigators and a uh, member of a network of national coordinators. So we have uh, at this moment in 14 EU countries, we have national coordinators and we are still growing. Which brings me um, to the last part. So I see I only have seven minutes left. So uh, let's um, uh, take care of this uh, relatively quickly. So what would be the good practices? How to deal with this all? So as I said, so I would encourage people to report internally instead of going straight to the authorities, which they are allowed to do. Um, and also, uh, we have seen that more reports usually means that you have better business results. So I would like to have as many reports as possible, but, but how to accomplish this? So, or put it differently, why would people not report internally? Well, the main reasons for that is that they are afraid of the consequences. So they are afraid that they will be fired or they, will, uh, they are afraid it will damage their reputation. Another reason could be that they think that nothing will change. Eh? Like, okay, so I can make a report, but will it have any effect? Or perhaps they don't know how to report. So how to take away those concerns? Well, these are my suggestions. So I would say, roll out a short, easy to understand reporting procedure. Uh, think of a good name like ethics helpline or speak up procedure and, and try to avoid legal jargon and um, make something that is easy to understand. Um, this might be challenging, um, uh, especially if you're working in multiple EU countries. Uh, so uh, like, for example, the draft Dutch law says that uh, in your reporting procedure, you have to define what is a breach of EU law and you have to define what is wrongdoing where public interest is at stake. So I can already see the, uh, uh, the, the large legal text coming up. Uh, so, but there are other ways on how to deal with that. So um, and I, I'm thinking, for example, to make a very short reporting procedure and then um, make a, a little bit of a longer um, uh, investigation protocol uh, that contains all this mandatory information. Okay, another... Um, option would be to make it possible to report anonymously. Yeah, so if people are afraid that they will suffer um, from retaliation, you cannot retaliate against somebody, somebody who you don't know. Yeah? So I always to say, tell reporters, well, if you are afraid uh, that you will suffer retaliation, uh, submit an anonymous report and, and we will take it from there. They are usually uh, more difficult to investigate, um, yeah, but it can take away some of the concerns. And I would say, make the procedure accessible to anyone. Yeah, if you want to receive as many reports as possible, just make it accessible to anyone. Uh, put the link on your external website. I'm uh, almost there. And um, after the slide, I will start uh, answering questions. So I would say, um, um, it is also important to create trust, trust in the procedure. So show what happens with the reports. Uh, so provide some regular feedback to the reporter. Do not wait three months uh, with providing feedback. Um, eh? I, I would say um, it depends a bit on the situation, but I would say at least monthly, maybe even bi-weekly. Uh, provide feedback to the reporter so the reporter knows that we, you haven't forgotten about him or her. And also, um, uh, and that is also uh, one of the, uh, the questions, so report the statistics. Eh? In the Netherlands, this is mandatory. So in the Netherlands, uh, you have to... Um, uh, submit an annual report to the Works Council um, uh, every year. So if you do that, uh, why not uh, submit it to a broader audience uh, and show what you are doing with the reports? Uh, how many do you receive and what is the result? You can also describe an anonymized case once in a while eh, and, and demonstrate how happy you were with the report. You cannot do that with all of the reports. Eh, and, and of course, some, many of them will be confidential so you cannot do that with all the reports. Uh, but at, uh, once in a while, you have a case where you think, oh, yeah, this one really went well. 
Uh, and you know what? We're going to make an anonymized case of this one uh, um, uh, to, to, to demonstrate, okay, so this is what we received and this is what we have done with it. It can also be beneficial to sometimes even celebrate the reporters. Uh, so um, I, I have done that once. There was a reporter I was really happy with and I brought him along to the global leadership conference where let's say the, the top 50 people of the company were uh, and, and I put him on stage <laughs> and I said, okay, so we are really happy with this guy and, and, and uh, because he made us aware of this problem. And uh, you know, this, this reporter, he will go back into the organization and say, oh, I was at the global leadership meeting in uh, who knows, uh, maybe in uh, uh, Hawaii. <laughs> uh, so, so he will have a story to tell to his colleagues. Uh, promote an open culture uh, in respect of mistakes and continue to repeat that message and eh? make it personal. So I, what I often do is um, after every face-to-face -face training that I provide, I tell people, okay, so this is the whistleblowing procedure. If you wonder who is behind that, it's me. <laughs> and then often even uh, within one or two hours after the training, I already start receiving the first reports. So um, uh, that happens as well. Um, so continue to repeat that message uh, and make serious that you protect the identity of the reporters and uh, conduct some solid investigations. So I uh, noticed that some people already have to go. It's uh, indeed, so it's three minutes before the hour. So let's um, uh, have a quick look at um, um, some of the questions. So what are the demands for language options in the whistleblowing system? Well, um, yeah, good questions. I, I don't see any uh, demands in the EU directive, but I can imagine uh, that, um, well, that there is no regulatory requirement, but I, I think you have to make sure that um, uh, your people can understand, um, that they are able to understand um, the, the reporting procedure and also the, 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 the whistleblowing system. So. As far as I know, there are no legal demands for language options. So um, I have one client, for example, where, where they uh, everybody speaks English. Uh, if they don't speak English, they will not be hired. So in this case, we only have one language, one language in our report, uh, which is English. Uh, but if you um, are working in multiple countries and um, you are used to working in multiple languages, it would seem obvious that also the, the whistleblowing system would have uh, the ability to handle multiple uh, languages. Yeah. Good. Before we go to, to the next question, let me just note that we had a question from Sabina that uh, I told her we'll be discussing the Q&As was the first question we had. And it's mm -hmm. about the definition of an organization. How do you define an organization in, in light of global multinational companies uh, where you have, a, for example, a centralized compliance department? Is that sufficient or does the directive stipulate that for each entity, I would assume each subsidiary within the uh, global company, does it need to have its own reporting channel? So that's the first we had. Yeah, yeah, that, that is a, a good question. So the EU directive talks about, uh, let's say legal entities. And then of course you have to go back into national law, what it's gonna say in your national law, but I, I expect that the national law will also talk about uh, legal entities. Uh, so if you are working in, in, a, in an international company, um, and I know this is going to be challenging, but if you're working in an international company, uh, this will be determined per legal entity. So if you have a legal entity in Poland and a legal entity in, uh, in, in Malta, one in Cyprus and one in Turkey. So Turkey is outside of the EU. Um, and, uh, but the ones in Poland um, and, and Cyprus, they will definitely uh, need to have uh, a whistleblowing procedure. And, and you have to think about, okay, so can we make uh, one whistleblowing procedure uh, that is gonna be valid in, in each country? And I predict that it's gonna be challenging because I expect that the national laws of the member states, they will differ from country to country. Yes. But I also think it's not gonna be impossible. Uh, so, so that is my view at the moment. So yeah. the divergence will not be uh, to that extent that it will hinder efforts to have a common uh, or at least similar um, procedures within companies of a group that is operating in the EU? Um, well, I think that, um, so 
of course, none of the uh, the local laws are final yet. <laughs> so yes. uh, so um, um, it's going to be it's going to take a few months before we know for sure. Uh, and um, I, I would ask people to sign up to my uh, blog to, to see. OK, so uh, because we're going to be reporting on that. Um, but I expect it's going to be difficult uh, to meet all the local regulatory requirements um, in, in one procedure. Uh, the thing I am thinking about is to make, try to make one uh, global whistleblowing procedure that is very broad in scope. So that would cover uh, almost everything. Um, and uh, then refer to a national investigation protocol because yes. the investigation protocols are usually national because of, of, of all the different uh, uh, national, uh, typical national uh, local deviations in, in labor law and data privacy law and, and what have you. So, so uh, that is what I'm thinking about at this moment. So that will allow you some flexibility. Okay, yeah. let's go to uh, uh, Leon who was about to leave. I'm not sure if, if he uh, left. Uh, who is the regulator in the Netherlands and how to report the annual reports? Yeah, so in, in the Netherlands, we're gonna have the, uh, the house for whistleblowers. Uh, so, um, uh, but um, um, I think most remarkably uh, in the draft Dutch law that is going to be um, uh, that is proposed and it's going to be um, uh, discussed in, in Dutch Parliament in September, uh, they there are eight different <laughs> eight different coordinators that have been distinguished, and uh, the, also the draft Dutch law says that you have to inform your employees about each of the eight. So, so that's the, the other thing. So if you're thinking about, I'm going to make a, a, a short procedure, um, you know, this is going to be a challenge. Um, but what I think is, uh, okay, so what you can do if you have a, a, a global procedure that you say, okay, so have a look at your local investigation protocol. In the, in, in the local investigation protocol, you make a reference to those eight um, uh, national regulators. Yeah. Okay, uh, yeah. let's see if we can manage uh, a couple of more qu questions. We're already above our uh, time uh, frame. With uh, um, Lydia asks whether the internal auditor can be appointed as an impartial coordinator. Yeah, I, I think it, it depends. So if you have um, uh, an independent internal auditor, uh, and, and normally I would expect that. So like, for example, if you are working with an audit charter that uh, safeguards your independence, uh, I would say uh, uh, probably yes. Yeah. Okay. And then, uh, Mariam, uh, what are uh, other protections regulated under the new directive for um, uh, whistleblowers? Yeah. Yeah, so, so you are um, uh, mainly protected against retaliation. So any form of retaliation. So um, uh, protected against um, 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 being fired or uh, being demoted or being suspended or uh, getting a bad performance review. Or cutting the salary. Or, yeah, yeah. Yes, so yeah. it's quite a broad uh, uh, range of uh, um, things yeah, that are covered. Is. Yes, that. indeed. Great, that's good. Um, so let me see if I've uh, left any other question unanswered. Um, does the whistleblowing directive, directive contradict the GDPR directive in any way? Yeah, that's a that's a, a, a good question. So the the, the GDPR um, still applies. So, um, so this is something that you have to bear in mind also when you are um, uh, conducting an investigation. So the GDPR still applies. Um, there are a couple of things in the, in the EU whistleblowing procedure like, uh, okay, so you have a duty to keep the identity of the reporter confidential uh, unless the reporter consents that uh, his or her identity is revealed. Uh, so um, uh, I know, like, for example, in Germany, there was a case the other day um, where somebody asked for his, uh, so he said, okay, so, so due to data privacy rights, I have a right to know, uh, I have a, a right to look into my file, uh, and I want to see who has 
uh, reported this uh, case to me. So who has accused me of doing something? And um, uh, this case was put in front of a judge and uh, uh, indeed so he was um, 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 uh, and, and he was allowed to see the identity of the reporter. Now, how this is going to work in the future, I don't know. So I think it's going to depend. So, so the, uh, the, um, um, the drafts, uh, so the European legislation says that you need to, to balance, a judge will have to balance the rights. Uh, so on, on the one hand, so the, uh, the, the reporter has the right to, be, to remain anonymous, to, uh, to, to, um, to, that his identity is kept confidential, uh, but there might be reasons uh, why uh, the identity still would have to be disclosed. So um, yeah, it, it, it depends a bit, but GDPR still applies uh, and you have to take that into account when uh, doing the investigations. Uh. Great. I think we've answered all of our questions, but I'll take my I take advantage of my role as coordinator and, and place one last question before we close up the session. Um, you said about public interest. If it's in the public interest, then uh, one is uh, allowed to go out and uh, disclose information uh, publicly, um, like the two reporters in Luxembourg which it was considered to be the public interest. So who shall define the public interest each time? Um, when does, <laughs> the, I mean, how do you frame it? I found that very interesting at the macro level to look at such an issue. It, indeed, indeed. And um, I have to say this, this phrase uh, in the public interest, this is something that comes out of the, the Dutch law. So I haven't seen it in uh, other laws of member states. Uh, so, so the European Directive just says that you have the right to make a report if there is a violation of EU law. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's so this, this uh, about the public interest, it's really specific to the Netherlands. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, then. Uh, thank you so much for that um, uh, very interesting, insightful uh, and informative uh, uh, presentation. It, I'm glad to see that all our ante ante attendees stayed up until the end. Only some had to had to leave. Before, I mean, for other um, possibly they had other obligations uh, that they needed to attend. Um, it was a, a pleasure to have you with us. I hope that um, you all enjoyed the seminar offered by uh, our associate, and uh, that we, we possibly you can also uh, look at uh, upcoming uh, training sessions offered by GERT through EIMF. That will be 